Thanks, Howard, so much. Um, and thank you to all of you for joining at 7 p.m. I know it is late, um, but we are so excited to have so many people joining us from schools, from districts, uh, nonprofit organizations. Um, I saw Colorado, Baltimore, Washington State, Allegheny County, Pittsburgh, Kansas, New Mexico. So, wow, what a showing. We really appreciate this, uh, you joining us um, around this really important conversation and how we can collectively support Support parents um, as they are leaning into and uh, partnering with them uh, as they support their children during the transition into high school, especially this year. Uh, so this webinar is in partnership with Remake Learning Days Across America. It is a joyful festival of learning taking place virtually and in person in 17 regional festivals around the country between April 22nd and May 23rd. Uh, and the purpose of these events is to engage families to learn alongside youth so they can better support their pathways and encourage creativity, critical thinking, problem solving, communication and collaboration, all tools that young people uh, will need for post-secondary success. Um, and, and most importantly, it's within the context of all of the places where they live, learn and grow. Uh, which makes it such a holistic model, uh, and we're really humbled to partner with them. Uh, so that leads us to today's uh, webinar. Um, and again, excited that there's such representation from across the country. Really want to stress from the beginning that this is meant to be interactive. It's a conversation amongst peers. Um, and so if you haven't already introduced yourself, uh, we really invite folks to jump into the chat box, uh, introduce yourself by name, your role, your organization. Um, and this time we'd love folks to share, again, to set the context for today's conversation. Um, and for many of us as parents, as practitioners, um, this is so personal. We'd love for you to just share what's one skill, a social, emotional, or academic skill or capacity that you think is most important for parents and teachers to partner up on during the transition into high school um, and, and looking toward uh, their future, especially during this year of remote learning. So we'll take a quick second for folks to introduce themselves and, and share that. Again, a social, emotional, or academic skill that we think is most important for parents and teachers to partner up on during those transitional years into high school. All right, I see lots of different folks joining. Time management, organization, self-advocacy, absolutely. Flexibility, yes, amen to that this year, right? Selecting best fit for student interests. Study skills, absolutely. Personalized paths, we're gonna be talking about that today, absolutely. Um, so please stay with us in the chat box. Um, we'll have time at the end for questions, but please feel free to chime in during the conversations. We're gonna have three different segments that hopefully are meant to uh, build on each other. Uh, so feel free to you know, drop in any relevant resources, ideas, an amen, uh, say more, um, and we'll try and follow along in the chat box. Um, so without further ado, um, I am so excited to be getting uh, the chance to speak with our good friends, partners in this work, uh, Robert Hendricks from He Is Me Institute, Robert Crosby from Flamboyant Foundation, and Crystal Requejo from Mexican American Unity Council. And so we're going to kick it off uh, with uh, Robert Hendricks, who I'm delighted to introduce. He is the founder and CEO of He Is Me Institute. We've most recently gotten to know Robert uh, as he participated in Learning Heroes Ask a Teacher video resource responding to parents' questions during this uh, pandemic. Robert has years of experience building programs and creating initiatives that support education equity. His work expands across curriculum development and teaching in K-12 and college settings, engagement in policy changing committees and in boards, and of course, in founding He Is Me, uh, which is focused on youth during the critical middle school years. Um, so Robert, as I um, delve into to this conversation with you, uh, you know, there's a new survey by Challenge Success and NBC News that just came out last week comparing high school students' experiences from fall uh, 2018 through fall 2020, um, really finding, and no surprise to I think any of us, that 
students are experiencing increased stress, anxiety, uh, they are less engaged and are uh, more likely to report strained relationships. Um, and I think this is consistent with our research. Our Parents 2020 found that uh, parents, one of their top concerns or their top concern, I should say, uh, and this is for K-12 parents, was their kids missing important social interactions at school uh, or with their friends. So um, my first question to you is, you know, you mentor middle school students and work with Boston school families directly. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your model and can you speak to those critical social emotional skills that are so important as students, particularly as they're transitioning into high school um, and especially in the context of this past year? Absolutely. Um, that's a beautiful question, Wendy. Thank you for having this event, uh, you, Howard, and the rest of the team. Um, I'll, I'll answer that question in sort of a long-winded way. I'll first tell you a little bit about He Is Me and the work that we do. Um, I think that gets to some of what you're asking. So we were founded in 2018 um, to get more Black men to become teachers. And the original plan was to do so through STEAM-centered activities and projects that they do with middle schoolers. Uh, and then when 2019 came around, uh, or 2020 came around, uh, obviously the pandemic hit. Um, and then that kind of shut down some of our programming, obviously. Shortly thereafter, we started to see a lot of racial tensions bubble up across the country. So that had us do a really deep think about is STEAM the focus that we should have right now or should we shift? So we shifted to social emotional learning. So now we have black male college students mentoring middle school boys of color in different social emotional learning skills. Um, and the, the way that we do that is one, by offering a variety of black males that they could relate to and get to know, but then more intentionally, our curriculum that they work with is going over the five social emotional learning competencies and we measure their growth. And we do it uh, both from how we observe their, their changing. And then we also kind of, I don't wanna say assessment, you can't really assess it, but we take surveys to kind of check their growth. Uh, now, in normal times, you hit you hit on a couple of the biggest struggles for a lot of students transitioning into high school. As you mentioned, I used to work at the high school setting and, and thinking about that transition. One of the biggest things is the stress that comes along with being a high school student. All these new things you have to think about GPA, uh, college or whatever you want to do next. Um, add to that this feeling of belonging, which is another huge struggle and thing that's on a lot of teenagers minds is how do I belong <clears throat> and both of those things are exacerbated right now they're not in close proximity with their peers or even with their teachers to feel that the same community that they might have felt otherwise and then there's a, a the layer of stress uh, that we're all figuring out is how do I do remote learning and especially if I still have the same goals and still have the same expectations while learning something new uh, so to, to combat that, what really needs to happen is a strong uh, relationship between the school, the home, and particularly the student, making sure that they that you understand where they are coming from. Uh, a huge part of our mentor, mentorship pro program is we spend a good chunk of time at the beginning of every session and at the end of every session just checking in informally because that just brings in the community, allows folks to express what they're going through, say how they feel. And then you as the leader, uh, whether you're a mentor, a college mentor like we work with, or a, a parent or family member or a, a teacher, you get to do the same thing and show that I'm also going through these things. I'm also figuring all this stuff out and maybe I can learn from you. All of those things can kind of fall, uh, um, put a cap on the levels of stress or disconnection that students might feel. Yeah, that really um, resonates with me personally. You talked about, you know, the sense of belonging um, as, a, as a first generation um, Colombian American. I just, you know, have these memories of sometimes not feeling like we belonged. Um, and as you talk about, you know, stress, we know that those social ties, I was just making some notes here, is, you know, that um, the social ties become that is part of that is part of having that sense of belonging become a protective factor that can help 
as you're dealing and managing stress, right? So they're so interconnected. Um, can you build on that a little bit in terms of, you know, how you help um, really foster that sense of belonging and particularly, um, you know, how can educators and community organizations partner with parents to, again, foster that sense of belonging and the, these skills and capacities um, particularly with middle and high school students. Absolutely. I'll, I'll actually give you an example, um, a real example from when I was uh, still working at the school setting. Um, I was an advisor of a group of students, as a lot of schools have now. And one of my students in particular has some ebbs and flows over his, his time in high school. I think by this year, he might have been a, a junior, maybe. And I did a few things to support him. Um, one, and I think this is the, the biggest one, is I stayed in constant contact with both of his parents and, and him. And what that looked like is a four person text message that went out every week about what the student has achieved, some, some struggles they may have faced. Uh, and now before I sent that text, I would actually have a conversation with the student to make sure he knew what was gonna go out uh, he and I had conversations about how he would navigate the conversation uh, with his parents because when, when I talked to the whole group, he will be the person that's leading it. Uh, so that's, that's one way to make sure that we keep everybody involved. In addition to that, the information that I shared out was information that I gathered from his teachers. So I asked his teachers every week to just quickly give me a, like a one to three mm -hmm. as a narrative, if you want to, about how he's performed this week and work he's completed, et cetera. So we can have some hard data that he could reflect on and then lead a conversation with his parents and myself. And to talk about next steps, uh, how did we get to this place positive or negatively, and then what we can do to continue to improve. And that helped him feel, one, that he was seen. And we, we know, we know you're there. We know when you're struggling. We know when you're doing well. And the other thing it does is make sure he knows that um, he's cared for and we're going to talk to your families and we're all going to be on the same page. Lastly, it let him be in the driver's seat of those conversations. We're not having back channel talks with his parents that he gets home and figured out that I called home and, you know, he's trying to clean up something that may not have been communicated correctly. He was in the center of all of those conversations. And while you may or may not be in a seat to do that in particular, it's the idea of engaging the family members engaging the school or the community organization that you're working with, and more importantly, letting that student lead that conversation, letting him or her talk about their own experiences and things that they're gonna do uh, differently or the same in the future. It's really important for educators and community-based organizations to remember that the parents are the experts on their child. They, they've known this kid for 13, 14, 15 years. You may be the expert on education, but put those things together and then let the student drive it. Then you get a holistic picture around what's actually happening, how to support this child, um, how to move forward with this child. And then naturally, those relationships start to grow. Trust starts to grow. And once you have trust, then you can have real conversations. If you think about the people who you are probably most critical of or the people who are most critical of you are probably your closest friends or family members or people who you know and, and believe what they have to say. It's the same type of relationship. If I'm gonna call home and talk to a family member, they're pretty sure even if it's critical feedback, they know it's coming from a good place and I'm doing it because I care. I'm not just calling because he screwed up and that's the only time we want to call you. I'm not just going to call you to give superficial praise. We're going to have real conversations about his growth and he's going to be the person that delivers a lot of that. So now we don't have that, that power struggle or that tension. The teacher said this, I said that uh, type of thing. And ultimately what that really does is put, is let the student feel like an independent growing adult they're, they're figuring out how to communicate different things. They're figuring out what works and what doesn't work. And now they're starting to internalize. When I do this, here is the outcome. And here is how I bounce back from those things. And in the long term, that's what really matters yeah. is that when they leave our care, a lot of students don't realize how safe high school could be. Um, but when they leave and they're on their own in a lot of ways, if they were able to internalize 
how to reflect on themselves and how to communicate that and how to reach out for support, then we're setting them up much better for success than if we did it all for them in high school. Or the opposite that we see is um, ignoring the student and letting them, you know, he's 15, you can do whatever they want. Um, you got to, it's a difficult balance to strike, but it can be done. Yeah. And, and you know, so, so you mentioned that sort of that's that agency, right? And that's interesting. Um, you know, probably not surprising. Our, our uh, research has shown pretty consistently that parents shift responsibility to their child during high okay. school years, right? Um, as you just mentioned. Um, but we also know that this is such an important time for students to develop those critical life skills and develop their sense of agency. Um, can you talk a little bit more um, about you know, again, and especially in this moment or in time, right, where it's not a sink or swim moment either, how do educators um, and out of school time leaders align with and support parents around finding that right balance of effectively fostering student agency? I know you talked a little bit, but can you build on that? Oh yeah, that's so that. tough. <laughs> that's so tough. Kids at that age are in a bunch of different places depending on who the student is. So first you have to know the child know their starting place, know what their, their goals and aspirations are and build on that. Um, but what's really important is that a lot of folks, adults, look at a high school student, look at a teenager and, and perceive them as an adult that hasn't yet matured. Whereas I see them as children who have matured. And that kind of shifts the mindset a little bit about the type of support that they need. Uh, it's key to let them make mistakes as long as they're not too detrimental, but mistakes are a part of life. The real, the real key is how, if you can bounce back and learn from them. And I'll give you another example. Uh, I was running a, this is when I was an assistant principal, I ran a senior study hall and had this young lady who was a straight A student. Um, she wanted to sleep throughout the study hall. So I tried to, you know, wake her up and tap her on the shoulder, those type of things, but I didn't send her to the dean's office or the principal. I didn't call home. I just kept trying to engage her and she didn't. The next day she didn't pass a quiz and the teacher asked me if she could retake it. And my response was no, but we can have a conversation about time management. And that completely shifted the ownership back onto her for her to think about, I didn't use my time wisely. I need to do something differently in the future. Next year when you're in college, there is no, no principal's office to go to. They're not going to call home because you didn't study in a library yesterday. Those are things that you have to experience and want for yourself. So when they make that mistake, follow up is coaching and teaching and, and letting them learn. They're going to be independent. If they're doing this so they won't get in trouble, uh, the moment that they don't care about getting in trouble anymore, which by teenage years, like detention is like, uh, I don't know, whatever. Um, so that's not going to be something to really lean on. Instead, they should lean within themselves. Why do I want to do this? Um, so that is really, really huge. Um, and then the second piece to that is following through with whatever that, I use the term consequence loosely, but whatever that consequence is. In this example, the consequence was that bad grade. And for that student, that was enough as a wake-up call. You know, if, if the thing is behavior related, as long as it's fair, you go through with it and still have a conversation. It's not us being upset. I'm going to give you an F because I'm mad at you or do whatever the behavior follow up is because I'm mad at you. That's not the point. The point is to learn a lesson. I'll give you one more, more creative example of that. I had a ninth grader um, who clearly loved to be in the school because he stayed after every day. <laughs> Didn't go to a study room or anything like that. He was just kind of there and wasn't always making the best decisions. Um, again, I didn't call home for anything negative. Instead, I told him, I signed him up for student council. He was a ninth grade representative for the student government. I'm like, there's a meeting upstairs. <laughs> you're missing it because now you're the ninth grade rep. And he's like, why would you pick me? Like, clearly you're a leader because you, <laughs> you know, look what you're getting everybody else to be able to do. And then the call home is, guess who just joined student council today? That completely shifts it uh, in one respect at the same time is supporting and coaching them to make better decisions, which is ultimately what we're really trying to get at, to have a, a holistic way of supporting children. It's not, it shouldn't be transactional. It should be relationship centered. Well, I think that example is also just um, speaks to being it being asset based, right? Um, you were looking and 
um, helping him see his potential and showing that you saw it, like you said. Mm -hmm. um, so that that's a beautiful and very concrete and like you said, creative um, example. So um, thank you so much. You are doing such important, powerful work and we're so excited that, um, that we are working with you and um, really appreciate you sharing those uh, really uh, helpful insights. Absolutely, thank you so much. Yeah. Um, all right, so our first Robert, we have uh, two Roberts the thirds, I will say on this <laughs> webinar tonight, which I think is pretty fun. Um, but before we transition to um, our conversation with the next Robert, um, wanted to share um, uh, and just reflect a bit on, on some of our research and which has shown that, you know, as parents, um, as students go into high school, parent aspirations continue to increase and focus more on college and career readiness, especially for our black and brown families. It is top priority for them. Um, and so with this as a backdrop, I think it's important to continue to debunk the myth that family engagement is just an elementary school thing um, and debunk the myth that, you know, those families don't care. They absolutely care um, and will show up. Um, but it's interesting to note that as those aspirations increase, um, you know, the question is how do parent perceptions of their child's academic achievement fare? Uh, so some of you may be familiar with our research, but for the context of today's conversation about transitioning into high school, um, we thought we would jump into a poll together and ask you, what percentage of high school parents nationally believe their child is at or above grade level in math and reading? So we're posing this as sort of, you know, nationally, but you could also consider this, um, you know, as a parent perhaps, or thinking about the families that you serve in your community, uh, how would they answer this question around their child being at or above grade level in reading and math? We'll wait a second here. All right, looks like about, all right. So over half of us um, say 65% and about 38% say 92% and 6% uh, say 39%. Very, really interesting. Um, so, you know, again, what, um, before we share this stat that we have been tracking uh, over the past five and a half years um, and have found consistently, we thought we'd first take a look at, you know, what's the reality is and, and how our students are faring. Um, and unfortunately, as you can see, um, it is, and I, we are all living it and breathing it, those who, um, you know, have children or working in our, you know, communities with our, with our families, it is just over a third of our students performing at or above grade level in reading and math. Um, and for many of our black and brown families, uh, it is disproportionately and you know, unacceptably lower. Um, so if you compare that to just over a third of our students are at grade level, what we have been tracking over the past five and a half years is that 92% of parents, regardless of race, income, or education, believe their child is at or above grade level in math. That is a stark disconnect um, and certainly not parents' fault um, and not teachers' fault, right? There's just a disconnect in understanding, a share, having a shared understanding. Um, and if you segment out the data, um, by high school, 96% of, pa 96 of parents believe their child is reading um, at or above grade level uh, in reading. So given this disconnect between what parents believe and actual performance uh, we really believe that parents need, deserve, and have the right to be at the table sharing their insights as well as getting a more concrete understanding of their child's uh, progress against grade level expectations so that they can most effectively partner with teachers um, and help their children reach those high aspirations that I just shared that we know that they have, especially as we've been saying as part of this webinar as the stakes get higher into high school. Um, so with that as a bit of a backdrop, I am so excited to introduce our next panelist, the next um, Robert the uh, Third, uh, Robert 
Crosby from he's managing director at Flamboyant Foundation. I have had the great privilege, um, truly, of getting to know um, and work alongside and learn alongside Robert um, as we are doing a pilot together in Washington, D.C. Um, Robert plays a critical role in driving Flamboyant's uh, goal to ensure that family engagement is practiced, it's protected, and prioritized across Washington, D.C. Uh, and it serves as the leader for driving their organizational strategy of ensuring that every public school in DC experiences effective equity-centered family engagement through their children's educational experience from pre-K through high school and beyond. He has a wealth of insights um, and is just such a great uh, partner and friend. So Robert, um, thank you for being here tonight. Um, and so my first question is, you know, from Leon is clearly such a leader in family engagement. Can you just share a bit about your model and how you support educators to first build trust uh, with families so that they can better come together around academic partnering? Yeah, well, first, thanks, Wendy, for that amazing intro. You've been a one wonderful partner as well. Um, I'm really happy to be here for this um, important conversation. And I think some folks are putting in the chat around the disheartening. Um, perception gap and you know that disconnect and it is startling but it's unfortunately not surprising based upon our listening and the partnerships we've been doing with um, stakeholders across DC but in particular high school stakeholders. Um, we've heard from high school families in particular in DC that you know they receive most of their information secondhand from their student um, and when you know they're not hearing from their teacher until things have gotten so close to the point of no return when we're talking about failing or, or major expectations. And I think to that point of student ownership and agency, we know it doesn't have to come at the expense of partnerships with families. Um, so to, to answer your question, you know, at Flamboyant, we champion what we call real family engagement with schools and school systems. Um, and we have a visual just to help you follow along with this, but you know, real family engagement is really about four big pillars. Um, the R stands for relationships with teachers that are built on trust, ongoing communication, ongoing communications, and shared power. When we're talking about the relationships and the funds of knowledge Robert Hendricks was talking about, of families being the experts and their children, that's truly valuing and creating a relationship where there's shared power because families bring expertise in their children. Educators, you bring expertise in pedagogy, right? Um, and recognizing there, there's a shared expertise there. But in order to do that, we cannot talk about family engagement, bringing families into the conversation without recognizing and making sure there's experiences where educators really challenge their own biases and quite frankly, promote racial equity. We're unapologetic that family engagement is equity work. Um, and that's real, that's a part and has to be a part of the conversation as we're thinking about educators seeing and viewing families and students as worthy of a prioritization of relationship building because they can be a partner to support the success of their student. Um, and then we get to academic partnerships, right? Where that is talking about student performance, but also social emotional development, executive functioning in the high school space. Um, and we know that family engagement can't happen without leadership in schools, school systems. I mean, communities who really create conditions for meaningful engagement. And so we really do think that the combination of these four areas allows educators and families to become true allies in educational excellence, right? Fostering a sense of belonging for everyone, students and their families to succeed in school and beyond. So, you know, our real family engagement model is grounded in research that shows that families play five essential roles in their children's education. I mean, we're going to show those five roles on another slide, it, but it's, you know, things that are not going to be surprising for you as educators, because educators actually play these roles too. Uh, communicate high expectations, monitor performance, support learning at home, guiding the path of their, um, their kids' education, and really advocating for their child. All families deserve to have access to the information and the connections to play these five roles well as, as educators and as school systems we have you know, important information to be able to share in partnership, as well as receive information from families to be able to ensure families can best play these roles. And then what the research really tells us is in the middle school and high school space, families and educators really are playing that coach role. Again, Robert Hendricks talked about this, but also Ann Henderson, family engagement researcher, she uses this term of coach. She's like, you, know, you, you see families in the elementary space as like a teacher. 
But in the middle school and high school, let's be clear, I would not be teaching my kid middle school math because I won't understand it, right? But I can coach my student to be able to, my middle school student, be able to monitor you know, their own performance and be able to say, hey, and advocate, this is what I need to support me. So with information and with partnerships, we know that you know, families of secondary students are able to coach alongside of the coaching that Robert Hendricks talked about that an educator is doing. When you only, when you have that powerful duo dynamic of coaching together, that's when we know students will be most successful. Absolutely, so powerful. Um... So, you know, you guys do such a, a great job and you and I've talked a lot about this this year that, you know, um, given the pandemic, the work, right, the, all of the research based work around family engagement um, doesn't change. It just might look different. So can mm -hmm. you talk a little bit more about, you know, what might look different related to building trust and partnering in these grades, especially during a year like this one? Yeah, I think that's a, a, a great question. And I'm gonna say the same thing when we have been talking about this. Yeah. You know, the medium and mode is different for how we're showing up in this space, um, but the conversations are, are really, the, the, the core crux is the same. And so um, I wanna go back to this idea of students playing a critical role as we're thinking about building trusting relationships with families, because the student plays a critical role in that that duo and that dynamic, because sometimes in high school, the student can be a gatekeeper to the family. <laughs> um, and so bringing the student into the conversation um, and so that that relationship trust, and I, again, I love, um, it's a great segue. I love Robert Hendricks example of what he said he did as an advisor teacher where he was really bringing in, it was a four-way text chain. So all stakeholders were at the table and though he was having conversations with the student beforehand to make sure, you know, hey, this is, let's talk about what, what we're gonna, what I'm gonna be sending to, you know, to all the stakeholders. You're gonna see it though. There's, there's transparency. So we've seen when those relationships between teachers, students, and families um, are done cohesively, um, and there's not as much sole focus on just the student relationship, which most high school educators, that I think is where we're hearing they say they spend more of their time, is just focusing on the student. Um, that there is a level of, you know, families are feeling more embraced by the school community. They're able to then lean in more. Um, and I want to give a little bit of an example of what that, that you know, feels like for a family member. Um, we, we talked to one of our family trainers in DC, I'll call her Monique, just for anonymity, but she was feeling really frustrated about, um, you know, her daughter Aaliyah's performance. Um, she, Aaliyah was struggling in some classes, um, but she wasn't hearing anything from her daughter's teachers. Um, and, you know, Monique took some time to reach out, but, you know, she quite frankly was like, this feels a little disrespectful, right? Like if I'm reaching out and I am not getting accurate, I'm not being able to get in touch with you all, right? Like maybe you don't value and see it as an important, you know, um, component of your job. So she was feeling quite discouraged and, um, you know, she heard from the teachers a few months later asking her to come to presentations like, you know, they were doing, they were presenting their portfolios and she was not going to come. She was like, I wasn't coming, you know, like you can't like if you are, you know, disregarding me when I think something is important, but then you want me to show up when something that you are saying is important, right? That's not going to happen. That's where trust breaks down, right? Um, and so... She told a story about the Mr. Brown who actually, you know, made the effort to have a relationship building conversation, if you will, with Ms. Brown over, or with Monique over the phone um, before the presentation. And, you know, they were able to talk through like why he hadn't been in touch before. She was able to give him some honest, you know, her honest feedback and thoughts. He listened. Um, but she was like, hey, having that conversation with him made me feel comfortable. It made me feel, start to feel valued. You listen to me. And because I started to build that, she's like, he was the only teacher's portfolio presentations I went to for, you know, for her daughter. And while we can say like, well, you know, she shouldn't be making decisions based upon that relationship. We have to recognize the historical nature of distrust with families and school systems. And then when we are then making certain choices and not prioritizing or only seeing and wanting families to show up when we want them to, how we want them to, 
that are those are the, the conditions that really break trust rather than up front seeing the value and working towards that trust from the very beginning because we recognize their inherent value. Yeah, so I, so much there. Um, you know, you talk about that that trust being broken, and that's something that you and I talk about, I think, weekly, right, on our calls. Um, and and um, what are some of those barriers that you've experienced with family engagement? Again, focusing on high school. Um, yeah. Can you build well, on that a little bit? Um, there's there's five there's five big ones. Um, we'll show them. Um, and um, but we're gonna give some some you know um, some solutions to these as well, but. We, um, about two years ago, when we were starting some part deep partnerships in high school, we talked to about 100 high school stakeholders in DC. And these were the five things that really, um, you know, rolled up to the top. First and foremost, educator capacity. We know high school educators are teaching, you know, sometimes 100 students, sometimes more. And so the idea of adding something else to an educator's capacity feels undaunting. Um, we heard that time and time again of I don't have the capacity or time to be able to, I know it's important, but I don't have enough time to actually make that happen with 100 students and 100 families. The other thing we heard um, a bit about was those educator mindsets in the sense that they believe their primary role was to build relationships with the students. And you know they, they quoted the things we talked about. It's more about student agency and student ownership. So I'm gonna focus on the student. I have limited time. I'm gonna focus on the student. That's going to impact my experience the most. And then the other thing that, right, when we talk about family engagement in high school, because it's, you know, you don't always hear it as actually, no, you are showing up as a coach. We were hearing family engagement in many different ways defined by high school stakeholders, from fundraisers to bake sales, you know, to um, just the family showing up to PTCs or showing up to the culture nights. Um, it wasn't steeped in family engagement to support student academic success. Um, and the other couple of things was unwelcoming environment. We heard from families saying, right, like every time I come into the building, I feel unwelcome. We heard families say I have to go through metal detectors, right? Like most high schools in DC have metal detectors. That's the first welcoming into the building, right? It doesn't feel like an environment that feels welcoming. And then, of course, we heard the complexity of high school really just complicates things. There's so many people, so many places to go to. But we heard some promising practices from educators, and I want to make sure I share those things that folks can take away, really, and think this is what we can do about these complexities and these barriers. And really what those things were, being able to do the cohort model. Robert Hendricks talked about being an advisor. When you break down students into small groups for high school educators own small groups of um, students. Okay, there we go. The cohort model is the, the one in the tan. That made it feel manageable for students, for, for educators. And families really had this go-to person. That's a promising practice we've seen um, really work. We know defining family engagement and making sure that there's a clear definition. We endorse real. Um, so we help schools to, to recognize that, you know, that is a common definition but also teachers have to have training and reflection time for family engagement. Just as if we think about training and professional development for other things um, like you know, your content, this is also necessary to have the training time, to have the reflection time, particularly when we're having, we need educators to reflect on what might be unrooted biases that's behind why they reach out to certain families and not other families. And then the final thing is just systems to share information that really make it easier. I think um, Robert Hendricks talked about, he would go to the other teachers and get some snapshots. There are systems that schools have that make that sharing of information much easier so that it, you don't actually have to like, you know, do that legwork of going and say, let me talk to every teacher, but actually we have a place where we keep that information. So we can all easily, you know, make sure it's easily accessible to be able to ensure families are getting the information they need. So helpful. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think uh, I'm gonna end with uh, a silver lining question, which I think all of us in the family engagement space have been thinking a lot about over this past year. So um, what's one thing we've learned as a field so during the pandemic that you hope we, and the collective we, right? Parents, educators, mm -hmm. the field broadly, uh, hold on to once we get to the other side of this and, and perhaps honing in a little bit as we think about middle and high school students. 
Yeah, I mean, I think there's um, a lot of great instances where we're seeing that there's a greater appreciation of educators and families on both sides. You know, families are getting a glimpse on what educators are doing because, right, they're in their homes now. They're seeing through some of the districts having to do virtual learning, they're getting to see the passion and the energy and, and the hard work of educators. And they're recognizing, you know, how much, how hard that is. They're also, educators are getting to see how much families are doing to set their kids up and how families are giving their best. The shared humanity that we are seeing between, you know, families and educators has been something that I truly do hope we will hold on to. Um, and that will allow us to do more listening as we're making decisions um, for reopen and really rethinking education, really putting families and students at the center um, and, and in a more intentional way. I think it's a beautiful way of saying it, shared humanity, right? Um, and so thank you, Robert, so much um, for making time to share um, your insights with us. Um, and, you know, as both Roberts <laughs> shared, uh, supporting parents and students around the social, emotional, and academic progress and development during these transitions, it helps set students up for success, right? Um, and thank you to both of you for giving such concrete, actionable um, strategies and examples. Um, and so I'm excited as we transition into um, our final segment before bringing everybody back for questions, um, wanted to share that, you know, this, webinar is part of our launch and Learning Heroes is so excited to partner with Remake Learning, PTA, and Univision, as well as local partners uh, nationally and especially in Washington, D.C., San Antonio, and the New England area uh, to launch a, a new parent resource called Paths to Success. It's um, really all intended to help jumpstart the transition into high school and beyond, really focusing in on that trans those transitional years. Um, so I wanted to share a little bit about the campaign. Uh, like all of our resources, our parent resources, it's bilingual and it includes uh, digital and print parent resources, as well as an easy to use social media kit for organizations like yours. Um, it's organized around five concrete tips that can be shared with parents as a one pager or a more in-depth uh, landing page as we're looking at um, and, um, and that has related resources and articles and tools aligned to each of the themes. And a big part of what we do is um, curate great content from partner organizations. Um, and so on this, um, we have you know, content and resources from folks like Khan Academy to Ed Navigator to College Board and more um, for parents who really want, and students who really want to dig in um, more. Um, so the, the, the five key themes are all around a lot of what we've um, been talking about tonight, which is you know, knowing those academic milestones, leaning into life skills, those critical social and emotional skills. Um, also leading into interests and passions, making that connection between what our kids care about and what they're learning uh, in the classroom. And then to more um, sort of tactical things like how to make class choice options, uh, class choice selections. Um, and then finally planning ahead for college um, and or technical school costs, which we know from our research, um, it keeps families up at night. Um, so as always, I think most important for, for me is that our campaigns are designed to really be embedded holistically within existing local programs and communities. Um, in order to strengthen ongoing family engagement, again, within the context of, of local community. Um, which leads me to our final uh, panelist for tonight. I am thrilled to introduce Crystal uh, Requejo, who is Communities Program Manager at Mexican American Unity Council. She's a partner of ours, um, and we've recently been connected, but um, really, so grateful that she's here tonight, given all that she's been through over the past week. So thank you, Crystal, for making time. Um, and so if we could, you know, sort of kick off by you sharing um, a bit about um, Mouk's model as it relates to supporting families um, with social, emotional, and academic um, supports. And, um, you know, it, again, just in the context of what you've been through, I think it's the power of, of all that you do for families. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so a little bit on Mock. Uh, Mock's goal is to have an entire family, uh, kind of to support the entire family through a holistic approach. Our goal is to help our families lower outside stressors. Um, most of our families are just, it's just been exacerbated with um, 
with the pandemic. So even though they're already stressed, now they're even having other stressors kind of be on top of them. And so we want to make sure that we're helping the entire family succeed. And so we want parents to become advocates for their children. Um, we want to make sure that we're providing a space and creating a safe space for the families to grow and learn through our staff and through outside partners. Um, and just to be able to teach parents about the system and the processes mm -hmm. uh, of, of within the school because sometimes it's just not it's not being shared and I think that Robert both Roberts mentioned this right that sense of belonging and trust um, sometimes the trust hasn't been there and so it's important that we educate them about what the processes are um, because sometimes it's not that they, they don't fully understand it and so we we know it takes a village as well and so relying on our community partners um, really is it helps us further our reach and leveraging all of our resources to assist our families and so from city, the city of San Antonio, to community organizations, to nonprofits and, you know, corporate um, companies, we all come together. And I'm, we're very fortunate here in San Antonio to have this partnership and this network built um, mm -hmm. to help other families kind of continue working together to, to really just strengthen them at the end of the day. Um, so MOC primarily works with um, Latino, first generation Latino students. And many of our families are going through this process together. So most of them have never completed graduation. So they're going through this with their child. They don't understand what GPA is and just a lot of these simple terms that might make sense to us, they don't really understand. Um, I'm a first generation college student. So I understand how hard it is sometimes for our families when they're going through it and how critical the support that these families need. Um, and so I, I really want to make sure that when we talk about Latino families, a lot of them are facing um, just kind of this growth with, with the children as well. And so the transition from middle school to high school is so critical for most of our families. Um, it's not explained to them very well sometimes. And so for from the changes the students are facing personally to academically, there's so much happening during this transition that must be explained in order to set students and parents up for success, not only for the next four years, but also beyond. Um, MOC's goal is to assist families in a culturally competent way and reduce language barriers to help families be prepared and ready for this critical transition. In our city, if you look at the west side of San Antonio, which is a low income community, we see that the graduation rate is 50%. If you compare that to an affluent uh, community in San Antonio, it's 98%. So we know that unfortunately in ninth grade, we're losing most of our students. Uh, and so we know that in this trans educating about this transition and the support is key for success for our families. Yeah, thank you. That resonates really um, personally. I know, um, you know, my parents didn't know how to navigate the, the college um, system. And so, you know, I was, as we were prepping for this, I was sharing with you guys that, you know, in hindsight, I wish I would have applied to some reach schools. I just didn't know. Um, so I applied to safety schools that I knew I would get some, you know, some help with. And so um, I think it's just, it's such an important service. I also, having worked in San Antonio, that the power of that cross-sector collaboration, um, I think really differentiates how you, how you work together, um, which leads me to, um, you know, we're so thrilled that you're using this new resource called Paths to Success. Can you share a little bit about how you're using it within really focusing on sort of the, that local context and what you're already doing? Yes, definitely. So with the pandemic, we shifted our programming. And so we're helping fam our families during this time, of um, the difficult time that they're facing with COVID-19. So Mock has been doing outreach with food distribution. And so we hold um, weekly distributions of hot meals, perishable and non-perishable items. And so families come for food assistance, but they leave with a wealth of resources. So we have added the Path to Success parent resource to the information the families are receiving. And so we kicked it off. Um, the last week we had a little bit of a hiccup the, the week before we started the initiative. And so we're continuing this weekend to be able to hand out the Path to Success resource to our families. Um, and then also we have 25 plus years of partnership with our school districts here in San Antonio. And so we're able to work through, through with the parent liaisons um, to make sure in a virtual way, now that we had to change it a little bit. <laughs> so we're working with the parent liaisons uh, and really they, they work tirelessly to, and they build relationships with our families. They build trust with their families. And so they're, they're a crucial piece to what we do. So they help connect us with the families to be able to provide these resources such as Path to Success and you know, just different courses that we're able to provide and resources um, to lower the social disparities of health for our families. And so for us, um, through the partnerships that we have and through our food distributions and COVID relief uh, programs that we have, we're able to distribute path to, the Path to Success um, parent resource here in San Antonio. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, it's, it's for me, it's so, um, 
exciting and rewarding really um, to see these tools being used in the way that we intend them, which is truly to be used organically within the context of what you're already doing, meeting families where they are, supporting them and giving them that, again, strength-based messaging and really concrete resources, um, you know, as, as part of food distribution or wherever you are meeting them. Um, it doesn't have to always be, you know, in a formal parent workshop. Um, so appreciate that partnership. Um, and so as we um, head towards the close tonight and, and, and bring in questions from participants, um, want to build on what, um, you know, both Roberts were sharing around, you know, parents really being the experts of their children and how we um, bring, help ensure that they are at the table. Um, would love to hear from you. You mentioned that you work predominantly with um, first generation and, and Latino families. Um, through that lens and that experience, what assets and strengths do you think they bring to the table that the field and the education system needs to be better tapping? So yeah, I think that some of the strengths that our families bring are, are just the resiliency. I think they're, we're a very resilient group. <laughs> and so, I mean, in the midst of, of this pandemic, we've seen parents overwhelmed and the children, um, just everything changed overnight. And so we didn't have time to really gather ourselves. We just had to jump in. And so they became very resourceful. Um, and we saw parents, you know, park behind buses to get Wi-Fi for their children. And I mean, they even students just finding being innovative and thinking outside of the box and how to continue learning and gathering um, virtually to, to do groups and, you know, contacting nonprofits to be able to to continue learning. And so I think that resiliency is one of the biggest strengths that I see within our Latino families that they're creative, um, they're innovative. And when it comes to their children's education, they want the best for their child. They put them first and education is key. Um, when you were pulling up the stats earlier, it was 87% of Latino families want their children to attend college. And I think it's the, that that's a big statement because most of our families want their children to do better than, than they did for themselves. And so education is super important. And so we know that for, in order for our families to succeed, it, it's really just tapping into that resiliency, knowing that they want to be a partner. And again, it's just creating that sense of belonging for parents and for children, like Robert had mentioned. I think in order to have, have, have a seat at the table for them to be there, to have these conversations, um, I think that it, that's how we're able to include our families and make sure that we're enabling them to succeed and to go on into college and make sure they're getting degrees as well. Yeah, amen to that. I couldn't agree more. Um, you know, my dad uh, is a machinist with an eighth grade graduation. My mom, on the other hand, has, has two um, master's degrees, both very different upbringings, but from both of them, I would say my greatest asset as a human being um, and as a professional is that resiliency and, and, and that work ethic, right? Like it says ganas. Mm -hmm. um, for yeah. me, that is, I will forever be grateful um, for that. Um, and so exactly. thank you, Crystal, for all that you are doing for families. And again, for being here tonight after the week that you've had. Um, Want to thank all of um, our panelists. And I think we're going to open it up to, to Q&A and bring everybody back. Um, so Howard, I will hand it over to you. Yes, thank you so much, Wendy. Um, so uh, as we continue in the chat box throughout the course of the webinar, if you have any questions for any of the panelists, um, please use the chat box function or the Q&A function to share your question. Um, and we'll start with uh, one question here. Um, it's a question based off of social and emotional um, skills and it's how can we keep middle schoolers motivated during virtual uh, learning in virtual school? So and this is a question for any, any of you guys. Any of our panelists want to take this? Yeah, there's a, a few things that pop in my head. Uh, first of all, that's that's probably challenging, I would <laughs> imagine. Um, but it's important to have both short and long-term um, incentives that are not just external. Uh, also figuring out what's gonna keep them internally motivated. Um, a, a good strategy that I like to lean on is um, what could what can we show in the very immediate term to show that you are making progress, that you are engaged? Um, that can be anything from a shout out, <laughs> like saying the student's name and a shout out, you'll be surprised how far that will go or a sticker. 
<laughs> even adults love stickers. <laughs> <laughs> um, and in the long term, um, to think about the, the delayed gratification, which is an underlying skill that we're building as well, what are those stickers or shout outs add up to? Um, that's a, another way to do it. And then also thinking about what they want, ask them directly. If you do this, then you know how can we celebrate you? Um, yeah, just getting them engaged in that conversation. Ask them because if you guess and you're wrong, then that's that's not going to do anything. It could have an opposite effect. <laughs> so ask the, directly ask them that question. Yeah, the only thing I'll build on that is you know really understanding what's behind this engagement. And sometimes, right, like they're very real basic needs, right? Like as our, our students are humans, right? Like. And so we have to recognize that, you know, until I can show up ready to learn in this home environment, they might be the responsible for getting their little, you know, brother and sister online. They might be responsible for the cooking, right? We, we have to be conscientious and, and ask um, and understand what's behind the disengagement versus making the assumption that it's, you know, is because they don't want to be engaged. I love that. I love that. Thank you, guys. Uh, so we have a question um, from the chat box. Uh, what simple tips can we give parents to stay engaged as a coach for their kids? And Robert Crosby, I'll give this to you uh, to start us off. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, I want to just make sure we think about the framing of that question. Families are always engaged as a coach for their kid. We may not see it. It may not be in ways that, you know, are visible. But I think we need to always keep that at the forefront. They are coaching their kids, they're getting them up and they're bathing them. Like there are a lot of invisible things. So now if we're talking about the coaching alongside educators, then that consistent communication is just like any other relationship. You have to be consistent in what you're pouring into the relationship. And we hear time and time again, the number one differentiator for families that will actually determine trust is how often they're hearing from a, a educator. So it is that the simple thing is communicate, like consistently communicate and always assume that they're already coaching and that they are coaching, even if you don't see it. Sorry, I'm muted. <laughs> so piggyback on your uh, answer, we're getting a lot of questions um, about trust, right? That idea of trust. So, uh, so to any of our panelists, um, what are some strategies um, or some tips that you can give uh, to help share, uh, to help build, I should say, build trust between educators, families, and students? That seems to be a big uh, theme tonight for all the questions. If I can jump in on that one. I think it's making sure that we, we, we reach out first because sometimes there is fear there in the parent's mind of what are they gonna say or how do I start the conversation? I think it's you starting to build that trust. You taking that first step is very critical. Um, I think when we talk about the parents being involved, they are, like they said, they're already coaches. They're already making sure that they're eating breakfast, that they're doing their homework. They're on top of that. So it's just us making sure that we take that first step to continue opening the communication. Because a lot of times they've never had a conversation with the teacher or the principal or the counselor and they don't have the education maybe sometimes behind them to feel confident enough because you are intimidating to them. So breaking that barrier is very, is very critical. Yeah, and um, I love that, Crystal. I think one of the best things that can happen, especially as an educator, is that you make a mistake because once you own up to it and have that conversation with the family and student, that could really change the relationship. If you know that you didn't do the make the best decision in retrospect and then you own up, that just breaks the barriers. Now everybody's ready to own up when they make those same mistakes. Um, so just being open and honest and, and comfortable with the fact that you are human as well. No, we are about to wrap. I, I see this question around do some, do some educators not want to talk to parents on this. It's like, I, I will say that just as Crystal said, sometimes there's that families are like, hey, I'm not confident enough or like there might be some things. We see that in educators too. Educators are not trained to build relationships with families in most education prep um, pipelines. They're just not, particularly when you talk about building relationships across lines of difference. And so um, that's where that training is important because it, it may not be they don't want to. It could be like time capacity, the conditions in their school don't make it conducive to have the time. Or it can be like they don't know, how, they, they, they're scared. <laughs> they, don't, they don't know how and they're afraid. So 
Um, I just thought I, I answered that for the, the, the person put that in the chat. No, thank you so much. And I appreciate all of our panelists for uh, joining us today um, for this amazing and really, really interactive and engaging uh, webinar. Um, be sure to join us for the rest of our parent and educator webinar series um, in March, April, and May. Um, you can get more information um, on these uh, upcoming webinars. Um, I'll put the link in the chat. And also keep your eyes open for a blog and recording of the webinar that you can share with your network. We'll be uh, sending that out um, early next week. Um, and this was so inspiring to hear from thought leaders about engaging parents to support their teens and tweens. Uh, so now we wanna hear from you. Uh, you can put in the chat box one idea or strategy or aha that you're taking away from today's session. And once again, thank you guys so much for joining us.